don't speak Italian. But anyway, the first, I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me. It's always a pleasure to be here in Italy. And it's also a pleasure to see the first day that I came is about 15 years ago. And it's really exciting to see how well the association is doing. Now there is an European Federation and things are moving, are moving forward in a very good direction. Of course, probably not as fast as everybody would like, but as we have seen in the previous presentation, and we will discuss a little bit further, there is a lot of clinical research going on, and our understanding of williams barre syndrome and all the medical history is, is, has increased significantly during the last few years. And I'm going to try to talk a little bit about the research that is done at the molecular level to try to link the genes, the code that is in our cells, to the pathogenic effects. And with this approach, to try to understand the mechanisms and to be able to improve the management of these individuals and to develop probably targeted therapies. It is a shame that Giuseppe Merla, who was supposed to give the first speech, has not been able to come. He was going to give an overview, so I was planning to talk a little bit more on specific advances on research, but I will try to introduce it slightly. And, well, most of you know well, uh, it's a little bit more than 50 years since the uh, Williams syndrome was this, described for the first time. In fact, it was described by a pediatrician in 1952, and it was called idiopathic hypercalcemia. Stapleton, a few years later, related to the, the hypercalcemia, the idiopathic hypercalcemia, with the fact that many individuals were being provided vitamin D to prevent rickets at high dosage. And those who did not uh, uh, respond to the uh, release of vitamin D were likely to have a specific syndrome. And in 1962 and in 1961, Williams in Australia and Berlin, two cardiologists, pediatrician and cardiologist describe the main features, the common facial features that all these children have, along with cardiovascular problem and some sort of in intellectual disability. And it took more you know, than 30 years, until 1993, to find the molecular basis of the syndrome, initially because a translocation disrupting the elastin gene was found in a family with specifically the same cardiovascular problem as patients with Williams syndrome, and they found that the gene elastin was disrupted, and then immediately the gene disc was deleted along with other genes in individuals with Williams syndrome. So now, in the last 20 years or so, since the knowledge of the gene, there is a lot of research that has been done, mostly in terms of the molecular characterization, the cellular and the generation of animal models that I'm going to talk about. Just to overview what are the main features, I enjoy a lot the clinical presentation before, and I think it's quite important to know what are the features that are really a hallmark of Williams syndrome and some complications that are probably anecdotal and are not relevant. So this syndrome has things that, are, even with a clear variability, are quite characteristic, and uh, as long as the facial features, the mild intellectual disability with a specific profile that always associates hypersociability, the problem with the cardiovascular stenosis that is related to the stiffness of the arterial walls, the, some endocrine problems like the hyper, hypercalcemia that has, has been described is transient and is probably not anymore any problem because the uh, diet is different and there is no vitamin D, vitamin D supplementation common in infancy, and it's an sporadic condition that occurs about in one in 7,000 to 10,000 newborns. And there are a few cases of parent-to-child transmission, but it's quite rare. And a few years ago, a completely symmetrical phenotype that is caused by the reciprocal genetic lesion has been described, and it's striking that the features are also somehow reciprocal, even the facial features. The language is a, very, a real problem in this patient and the behavior. They are mostly autistic instead of hypersocial. They can have vascular dilatation instead of, of stenosis, and they may have also other features as well. And the study, and as the uh, Professor Germain will uh, discuss later, of both syndromes together may help in the knowledge of the pathophysiological mechanism. 
So the main topic now is the common features, but with variable expressivity. And both things are really relevant for knowing what are the causes of that. And as I said, well, this was the presentation. It's quite important to have a very clinical uh, study in all cases and to share all the information for clinical molecular correlations and along with the information in patients and the knowledge that has been derived from the, the finding on individuals with partial deletion of the interval with partial phenotypes pointing to the function of the genes on that interval. It's also relevant to be able to generate mouse models. That is, is the topic that I was going to talk in more detail. And the main characteristic that facilitate that is that all the genes that are deleted in individuals with Williams syndrome are together also in the mouse genome. So we have been able to generate exactly the same molecular lesion in mice and also partial deletions and even single gene deletions in mice to try to recapitulate the problems that individuals with Williams syndrome may have. And also the functional cellular studies are quite relevant. Just as a summary of all the knowledge that has been triggered during the past 20 years, out of the 26 genes that are basically deleted in most of the cases, I will, inter I will go into the molecular mechanism a little bit later, it's clear that one of the main genes is elastin, and this is basically just the gene for the cardiovascular problem and some of the connective tissue-related problems, like the bladder or the constipation and things that are also probably related to elastin. There are some genes that I will discuss later that are also related to the metabolic complications, and the main gene that is involved in the neurobehavioral and the learning problems is probably GTF2I, along with other genes related to GTF2I that are drawn in, in green here. And this is what I will talk later on. The way to find, since many genes are deleted, the, the way to find which are the genes and which are the, the signals in the DNA that are relevant for the, the problems of the children in order, again, to try to manage them better and to find uh, the, the therapeutic options are basically this, to find if there is a mutation on the other allele, to try to differentiate the deletion if it's different between one individual to another, to find something on the genome that is also related to that, ABC. In, in some cases, if the origin, if the parental origin of the deletion could make a difference, and if there are other events in the genome related to that. We have studied all this, but I will talk mostly about these that are the real modulators of the phenotypic expression of, of Williams syndrome. Uh, this is kind of a complicated picture, but this is the uh, DNA fiber of the region on chromosome 7, and in gray you have what is the single copy region that is lost is the deleted interval, and the arrows with different colors are segmental duplication. Those are portions of the genome that have duplicated during the evolution of the human genome. Some of them are even human-specific. Some of them are functional, some of them are not. But the issue is that now being there predisposed out of our genome to rebrandments and to have children with Williams syndrome. So atypical deletions are quite rare. They have been really important, but are less than 2% of the deletions that are in the interval, and each patient has a specific phenotype that is unique because the deletion is unique. And they could be smaller, and they could be larger, but they are quite rare. 10 to 12% of the individuals have a deletion of 1.8 megabases, 1.8 million of base pair of nucleotides that is mediated by these blue blocks, and is the less common, and the most common uh, deletion that is about 90%, 86 to 90% of the, of the cases, is mediated by the orange block that we call the B block of segmental duplication. And I have drawn there the three genes that are inside that are genes in one of the blocks and are not genes, are pseudogenes in the other block, because this is going to be relevant for many of the things that I'm going to tell you later. In terms of mechanisms, this is quite basic research, but it's important, and it's important to know what is the recurrent risk for parents, uh, siblings, or for the patient itself. Well, there are some hot spots for the uh, recombination, and we have mapped those hot spots, and some of them are mediated by inversion, 
inversion is apolymorphism that happen in 5% in of the population, and well, about one in four patients has an inversion. There is a slightly, very slightly increased risk in individuals with an inversion for this. And the other thing is that depending on the breakpoint, there is a functional consequence on the copy number of two genes, NCF1 and GTF2. Uh, I are D2. So, and these two genes, as you will see, are important modulators for some of the phenotypic features. So going back to what is the mechanism of the disease, is known for a few years. That's the first thing that was found, elastin. There was a mouse created with an elastin knockout, and then, as has been mentioned before, many patients with specific mutations, only in elastin had been found. And in all these individuals and in all these mice, what you find is that there is a 50% amount of elastin, and this 50% amount of elastin leads to an increase in the number of lamella, the fibers that are probably worse uh, arranged in the, in the, muscle, in the uh, arterial wall, and that leads to a uh, stiffness of the arterial wall and a decrease in the lumen of the arterial wall. And that's something that is absolutely universal, and on individuals with decreased amount of elastin have, although the manifestation could, have, could be clinical or could be subclinical, but there is a stiffness and there is this problem in all individuals. And the other finding that we found a, a few years ago is when you do the correlations, Individuals who progress to develop hypertension, they usually don't have deleted one gene that is NCF1. And individuals with less risk of hypertension have deleted NCF1. NCF1 is shown here, is a member of one subunit, a protein that is involved in the oxidative stress. And having less protein leads to less oxidative stress. This studies initially had been reaffirmed by the studies by Beth Kothel and, and Barbara Pover, showing that even the um, QTL analysis, quantitative trailer analysis in mice, showed that the gene is also a main modulator of the cardiovascular phenotype in mice. So that leads to the, com the complication of the cardiovascular phenotype are later triggered by uh, the stimulation of angiotensin II. Uh, if you have normal copies of NADPH, you have increased oxidative stress, and if you don't have that, you are somehow protected. What was very good now is that we have now clues to try to go and treat this. So there is a medication that is an angiotensin receptor broker that is called Losartan that acts specifically here, and there are other medications that are still not approved for human use, but are also important for the assembly of NADPH, and it's aposinin. So once we had this information, we were able to go back to the mice, and since we already have mice that are missing the lasting gene, they have the deletion with the lasting gene, and as you can see here, they have thicker arterial wall. What we did is we crossed these mice that have a phenotype or a genotype similar to Williams syndrome with other mice that have less copy of NCF1. And by doing this, we generated mouse with the at-risk genotype for hypertension and mice that should be protected for hypertension. And after that, we were able also to treat those that were at risk for hypertension and cardiovascular duplications with these uh, two medications, aposinin and losartan. And even in mice, you can even treat them prenatally during the pregnant, uh, gest during the gestation of the, of the mothers. So just to sum up, that was published already two years ago. It was striking that we were able to rescue a significant part of the, of the phenotype. As you can see, in white is, is the uh, blood pressure on the left of the normal mice. In gray, the mice that have the phenotype and the genotype of Williams syndrome that have high blood pressure. And they, by gene manipulation in black, Losartan in blue or aposinin in orange, you can see that the, the blood pressure was completely normalized. The oxidative stress that was evident in the mice was also quite normalized. And the heart complication that is on the lower part on the right were not completely normalized, but were significantly improved. So just by treating with a specific medication that blocks what is known to be triggering part of the complication of the, of the human syndrome in mice, that is something that you can also 
of course, you have mice that are completely homogeneous genetically, and that's easy to compare the litter mice that don't have the, the genetic problem with the ones that have the genetic problems because they are exactly from the same genetic background. With that, the, the efficacy of the, of the medication was extremely high. So we proposed and we were granted to make a pilot clinical trial with, uh, in two large hospitals in Spain, although, well, it's quite difficult. This is, although it's not that rare, it's a rare disease, and to find enough number of individuals were difficult, but individuals that were higher than, all, uh, older than five years with a confirmed diagnosis and that have blood pressure above the 75th percentile, we try Lots of time, if they were not in the range of clinical hypertension, but they had high blood pressure, and with the normal dosage when they had clinical hypertension. And finally, we didn't reach enough for the placebo group, so the data is only from the patients. But to sum up, there, was a very, or there has been during one year a very good control of the blood pressure. This is just the average, so this is what is called the blood pressure index, and as you see, it was above the normal, that is one, and it was completely normalized on follow-up. There was a, uh, an effect with a raise in angiotensin and uh, renin activity, what is a little bit expected, but there is an increase. Uh, we don't know if this will increase or decrease in the, in the long range, but and the other thing that we saw is an effect, also decreasing some of the parameters, the ones that are really reliable, on the oxidative stress that is in the lower part of the, of the slide. So the conclusion of that, and it's not trivial, is that the angiotensin receptor blockers are extremely good therapeutic options for hypertension and even for limit in Williams syndrome because they go specifically to the two things that are affected, the triggering of angiotensin II and the NADPH oxidase oxidative stress. I'm going to show you other studies by comparing the mice with human and the, the utility of having now mouse in which you can do experiments that cannot be done in humans. Uh, we published recently the study of many metabolic parameters, confirming data that have been related, that have been created before and finding novel things. And it's more than 100 patients in this case. And as you can see here, we have mice that have the complete deletion, exactly the same deletion that is in human. And we have mice that have part, half of the deletion, the proximal deletion, and another half of the deletion that is the distal deletion. Those are called PD, partial proximal deletion, DD, distal deletion, and CD, complete deletion. And the advantage in mice is that you can do also the same blood test and urine test, but also you can study, of course, the tissue, like the uh, pancreas in this case, or the liver. So to show some of the findings, effectively, hypothyroidism was found in our population, as it has been described before. It's always subclinical hypothyroidism, so they have normal uh, hormone levels, but they have an increased TCH activity. It's not clear if it has to be treated. Probably in most cases it, don't, it doesn't need to be treated because most individuals in adulthood don't keep on that and there are no clear differences in the uh, performance in many tasks. If it's clinical, of course, it should be treated. But you can see that in mice there is also the same elevation of TSH and apparently is uh, uh, on genes that are in the proximal part of the interval. So mice with the proximal deletion have a clear increase of the TSH as well. Another thing that we found that was suspected but it was ne never described before is lower level of triglycerides. That's not bad because that's a protective uh, factor for other cardiovascular complications, but there is a shift to the left in the total curve, and there is a number of almost 20% of individuals that have low, really low levels of triglycerides, and there is a good candidate gene because it's known to be involved, and there are some um, studies done that this is a gene involved in the synthesis of triglycerides, that is MLX1PL, and we did the same in mice, and as you can see, again, both mice with the uh, deletion, proximal and distal deletion, show also hypotriglycerides, meaning that the gene is likely important, but probably more genes are also involved in this part of the phenotype. And another feature that was a biochemical finding, uh, they had also, we found increased bilirubin levels 
slightly increased bilirubin levels, but in a huge proportion, it's 20% of individuals with Williams syndrome. This is about 2% of the population, so this is a tenfold increased uh, risk. And this subclinical uh, increase uh, bilirubin is called Gilbert syndrome, and in the population has been associated to the function of a specific gene that is mentioned here, that is UGT1A1. And there are some variants in the gene that are related to this. We measured these variants also in the Williams syndrome patient, and we found that they have the same proportion of variants as in the general population. So what is clear is that in Williams syndrome, there is an increased susceptibility if you have the risk variants in the other gene to develop the phenotype. So the penetrance that is 40% or less than 40% in the general population is higher than 70% of expressed in this hyperbilirubinemia in Williams syndrome patient. In this case, we were not able to test that in, because it's mild and it's, it was not effective in, in mice. And now I'm going to go to one of the most important parts of the phenotype, that is the neurobehavioral phenotype. I'm going back to the mice that we have. We have these three deletions, and we have generated on the green side the knockout also of the more uh, specific gene that we think that is involved in this, in this phenotype, that is GTF2I in the phenotype of the neurobehavior. So we have, in this case, four different type of mouse, a single gene, one gene, a partial deletion proximal, partial deletion distal, and the entire deletion. And we perform the test to see if they have exactly the same phenotype as the most human patients have, and there are some tests that are done to test mostly anxiety and some locomotor we use, this is the marble uh, barring test. You put the mice in this cage, and depending on the anxiety, they will move, and they will just put uh, sun on top of the, of the marbles, and depending on the, the activity, you, you see the difference. You test also the ability to learn motor skills and the coordination using the rotor test, and there are also some tests that are quite relevant to test sociability. You just put one mouse and in a cage where it's another mouse, and you see which is the uh, interest in social interaction that the novel mice has with the other one. And you can measure the time that they're trying to interact with the new, or, the, or, the, or if there is no, no interaction at all. And after that, again, in mice, you can test also more important things also within the brain, like a specific uh, morphology of the brain and also spine density and that was focused mostly on the hippocampus. To sum up, all four mice, including the single gene GTF2I uh, deletion and no, no, all four, all that had deletion of GTF2I have increased social interaction, as you can see in these bars. They have decreased also learning of motor activities and they have increased anxiety yes, compared to the, to the controls. And on the right side, you see the morphology of the spine, of the dendrites in the neuron. And although that is not heavy, it's significantly affected. You have less density of spines in the dendrites of the neurons. And also, there are less uh, spines. The density and the number of spines is smaller. So now, we wanted to check if really GTF2I is the main gene for that. So the, the thing that we did is you, we just replace GTF2I to these mice. So if now we go to the mice with the deletion and we just put GTF2I back, we will rescue all the features. And that's what we did. We put this uh, gene inside a cassette that is a virus in this case. Of course, in this case, it has to be introduced in situ. So we just put them in the cistern of the, something that can be done in mice, of course in the system of the brain, and we just, these mice had been phenotyped before, so we had the behavioral test, we made the injection, at, and one month we first checked that the gene was expressing, and the gene was expressing, and we just could check the phenotype. And as you can see, well, this is compared, and on the, on the left side is the sociality test, so the, the mice who were completely hypersocial became normal, so, it was completely normalized. Uh, in the rotor rod, it was a clear improvement in the motor learning behavior. And even in the anxiety, it was better than the uh, 
previous situation, although in the anxiety test it was not as good as in the normal population. But there was a significant increase in all three features that we were checking. And if you go back to the right side, there was a normalization of some of the expression parameters also in the brain, but there was no clear effect on the morphology of the spine. That is probably like, it's just one month after the delivery. But anyway, GTF2Y was clearly a very good therapeutic target for this phenotype in mouse, and is for sure the main, it's not the only, but it's the main effector of the uh, neurobehavioral phenotype in williams barron syndrome. And just to conclude, um, we have also go back to, to humans and during the castration that I mentioned before of the breakpoint is where this other gene, GTF2I RD2, is located. And this GTF2I RD2 is called similar to GTF2I. It's not to complicate our lives, it's just because it's related. So they have domains that are related and they are supposed to function in the same pathway. And depending where the breakpoint occurs, you can get an extra copy of GTF2IRD2 uh, or a chimeric copy. That means that it's something that has accumulated an information that is abnormal because you join the copy that is in the medial portion with the one that is in the centromere, and that makes a protein that is abnormal and nobody knows yet how it works. And in individuals with Williams syndrome, we had validated that this chimeric copy is made. So depending on that, you have different, so we just try to correlate with uh, different features of the neurocognitive profile. And clearly, this, this chimeric form is associated with higher IQ, higher performance, high cognitive abilities, both in the verbal IQ and also in the performance IQ and in the global IQ. This is a small sample, and we are trying to validate with other samples. We are, have now samples from Canada and from the US, because well, dealing with uh, rare diseases to, to, to do these tests is, is difficult, but it looks quite striking. And that tells you that GTF2I is likely really important, and RD2 is interacting with GTF2I, and that's how probably it's involved in the regulation of this neurocognitive profile. And in fact, we have done that. We have expressed the GTF2I RD2 in cells to see how it works. It's a protein that goes to the nucleus. It's a protein that interacts with GTF2I. And it's a, if you input what is the chimeric protein, not the real one, the one that is yet generated in some individuals with Williams syndrome, those with higher IQ, not the ones that are more affected, the ones that are less affected, it's interesting that the protein doesn't go to the nucleus and it likely sequestrates GTF2I to go to the nucleus. So, as it has been done also by other groups, this gene is a fusion protein that is an antagonist of GTF2I. So the hypothesis now is if you have a chimeric copy that is not working well, it does not antagonize GTF2I. So clearly GTF2I is likely a good candidate and the pathway is a good candidate and this is a physiological model to try to, well, imagine how to develop uh, therapeutic options for Williams syndrome. So to summary, the genetics for these 20 years have discovered that there is a common deletion and the clinical molecular correlations show that there are genes that are important, there are additive effects, and it's not a single gene, but there are two main genes involved in the phenotype, elastin for the cardiovascular uh, phenotype and GTF2I likely for the neurocognitive phenotype. There are novel phenotypes that are, can be also ascribed as to genes in the region, and NCF1 is a modifier of the cardiovascular complications, what is good because now we have shown that there is improvement with specific medications that block the action of the gene, and what is related also the elastin arthropathy, and the anti angiotensin receptor blockers are likely the first option for treating hypertension and cardiovascular complications in williams barron syndrome. And then for the last slide, GTF2I is likely to be involved. And again, now we are in the first step, but there are also clues that probably will lead us to try to develop or to get ideas on how to interact with the action of GTF2I and to be able to, well, palliate some of the problems of the patient with Williams syndrome. 
and well, just to acknowledge, of course, the Williams Syndrome Association of Italy and also the one in Spain and all the patients here and everywhere that participates. I think that is extremely important, the contribution of the parents and patients for the research, because it's the only way that we can really find things. And this is a work that has been done for many people. This is on the left are the people, the current and the past people in the lab. And on the right, you have all the collaborators. It is important to have international efforts to try to get the best out of this. And thank you all for your attention.